welcome to the TB Consulting Interactive Webinar on how to solve the top three challenges amid the, uh, the pandemic. My name is Stephanie Nye, and I'm the Director of Service Delivery, and I'm your facilitator today. There's many personal and professional challenges we're all facing today due to the COVID outbreak. IT teams have had to unexpectedly shift to remote work and all of the implications that follow. As providers of IT services, TB Consulting and our clients are experiencing many of the same challenges, and we wanna offer insights and tips that may help you overcome these challenges. Today, we've brought together three experts to share their insights around these challenges. Each expert will share their perspective and insight and then engage in Q&A after each one of the sections. Um, today, we have Tyler Edged, who's going to talk about security risks and endpoint safety. Charles Montgomery, who will talk about remote access insufficiency and VPN readiness, and Eric Marshall, who's going to talk about bringing your own devices, the risks and the challenges. So to go ahead and start things off, we will talk to Tyler. So Tyler, security risk continues to grow. What are the biggest risks companies are facing today as a result of COVID-19? And how can companies address these challenges? Yeah, thanks, Stacy. So, um, you know, with this new uh, sort of shift in the paradigm and, and the, the shift to work from home and the social distancing that's been imposed at both uh, national and state level, right now recommendations, strong recommendations, but going forward, you know, maybe looking at even lockdown. So, um, you know, this is really, like I said, changed the way that we're working, right, and, and uh, pushing users to stay at home and, and get work done that way. So we're going to sort of look at the risks grouped into three categories here. So there's people, process, and technology, right? So um, within the people, right, you know, now users are, are at home, they're, they're more distracted, they're more... Um, you know, they're, they're not in their usual environment, right? They're outside their element, not their usual working environment. So that coupled with the fact that uh, unfortunately criminals, criminals uh, um, are taking advantage of this, of the panic and sort of the paranoia around this to uh, there's been a huge spike in and an increase in phishing emails, right? So criminals are taking advantage of this and uh, sending out links, you know, things like, um, oh, here's, you know, go and read what the, here's a link to the recommendations for your state for, for what to do about COVID-19 or uh, here's a, here's a, here's a PDF with, um, with, you know, a bad new vaccine that's been developed, open this PDF and, and look at what's inside here, right? Um, and the, these attackers are generally trying to get you to take some action, right? These are, like I said, generally will fall into either uh, clicking links or, um, uh, and that link will take you to a website that's that's compromised and it will try to exploit your browser to gain local access to your machine. Or it could be opening files, right? And then that will take advantage if it's Adobe, if it's a PDF, maybe taking advantage of a vulnerability in Adobe or a Word document taking advantage of the Word platform. Uh, or the last one that we often see is, um, is entering credentials, right? So um, this could be things like, hey, come here and sign up for, you know, and come here and enter your password. Your Google account's been compromised, you know, go in here and, and enter your Google account credentials, right? Aiming to steal credentials. Um, so looking at the people at the people arena and what you can do to sort of mitigate some of this risk, right? The big one is user education. So uh, there's lots of good training platforms out there. Um, and what they do is they'll provide whether, you know, whatever you're comfortable with, monthly, quarterly, annual training. Um, these are not super, you know, this is not an hour long seminar, right? These are generally pretty quick and easy. Um, so we recommend, you know, doing them at least quarterly or maybe even monthly trainings, uh, you know, just a couple minutes, just so it's constantly sort of top of mind for your user base. So these educations are going to provide them with information and a, and a way to fight against these types of attacks, right? So what are things that I should be looking for? What, what sort of suspicious actions may I see in emails? Um, so in addition to user education, the sort of uh, other side of that coin is, is then testing those users on what they've learned. So this is phishing campaigns, right? And again, lots of great platforms out there. Um, and what these do is they'll, again, monthly, quarterly, whatever you're comfortable with, uh, send out an email that will use the same tools, tactics, and techniques of attackers so that you can identify who in your organization is posing risk, right? And if there are users that are uh, repeatedly, repeatedly clicking on the links in the simulated attacks or repeatedly opening files, then you can spend some one-on-one -on -one time um, addressing those risks. But it's without, without doing these types of things, you have no way of knowing who in your risk is, is needing help and, um, you know, who might, uh, who might pose the most risk. So 
That's the people, right? And then looking at process, um, again, you know, whereas before, um, if you needed something from a coworker, uh, you would just go over to their desk and ask for it, right? Maybe the CFO uh, wants to, you know, some, some payroll to get paid or needs a, needs a vendor to get paid. He's going to go and talk to the accountant and say, here, you know, here's the information. Please go ahead and process this payment. You can't do that anymore, right? So now we're getting, we're seeing requests that generally would have been face-to-face -face are now coming across in email or Slack or Teams, whatever your communication method is now. So, um, you know, it's important to put process in place around these sort of things, right? And this is going to be different for each different business, right? If it's, if, in a, if your organization is only doing maybe one of these payments and the payments is just one example, but if your organization is only doing one of these payments a day, well then make every single payment that goes out require a phone call, right? Say, okay, you can't, you can't, you can email, but then you also have to follow it up with a phone call to say, Hey, this is valid. Right. Or if the person that receives it, they have to call you to make sure that it is valid. Um, and if your organization is doing thousands of these a day, well, maybe the, maybe the threshold is a thousand dollars, right? You got it. You have, it's a, it's a conversation. It's something you have to discuss as, as a business, but, um, you know, come together, work on, you know, what processes can be put in place to reduce the risk of, of somebody making a mistake or somebody falling for one of these phishing attacks. And then technology wise, right, there's a couple options. Um, uh, some of the really most effective and cheapest ones are, are email protection, right? So if you already are using, generally people use uh, Office 365 or the Exchange, Exchange and Office 365, and the E3 and E5 licenses come built in with some measure uh, of phishing protection and spam protection, right? So going in and you're uh, something you're likely already paying for, and if you go in there and configure that stuff properly, uh, you can dramatically reduce the amount of phishing emails you're getting. Another really easy one, and this one is actually free, is, is something called SPF and DMARC. So these are methodologies uh, built in the built-in functionality within DNS, your domain name system. And and what they do is they um, they can figure who is allowed to send and receive as you. So when you get an email and it says, oh, it's from the CEO and it's the, um, you know, it's he's asking me to buy gift cards or whatever the case is, um, you know, the SPF and DMARC records will help to cut down on the amount of that where you're seeing, oh, well, it says it's from my CFO and it looks legitimate, but it actually came from somebody outside of the organization posing as my CFO. So like I said, SPF and DMARC, those are totally free. You can Google those. Um, if you have questions about any of the things we've talked about or any of these technologies or what TBC's specific approach is to solving these problems, of course, you know, we're happy to answer those and reach out to us, but those are the three. Okay, thanks, Tyler. Yeah. Um, one question, though. So I, I can't help but think with all kids, dogs, cats, family members, um, we're all trying to work at home. Uh, we get distracted really easily. And let's say we click on a link um, and then we realize, oh no, our system begins to act funny, or we think we might be, have become a, a victim of some type of a scam. What can we do at that point? Yeah, that's a great question. So and again, every, every organization is different. So the, the first thing you're going to want to do pretty much regardless of what your company's policies and procedures are is, is remove internet access, right? So if you have done something like that and you've, and you've clicked on something and you think your machine is compromised, what they're going to do, what that attacker is trying to do is use your machine to what's called pivoting laterally. So they're going to use the, the point of presence they now have on your machine to go around and inspect other machines, um, as well as in exfiltrate data from your machine and send it back to them. So the first thing you want to do is get your machine off the internet. Now, whatever you're comfortable with, if you feel comfortable that you know how to turn off the Wi-Fi in your machine, do that. If you feel more comfortable just going and unplugging your home router, do that, right? But you want to kill internet access. What you do not want to do is shut off your machine. So I think this is a common, you know, like, oh, it's compromised. Oh, shut it. Turn it off. Close the lid. That's generally not what we recommend. Now, there are times where that is important. But in general, if you do, once you've done that, you've destroyed a lot of evidence, right? You've destroyed a lot of the data that's going to be really crucial for your secure, your follow on security investigation when they come back in and try to figure out what exactly happened, you know, how do they get in? What did they do once they were in your machine? You're going to destroy a lot of that evidence. So, um, you know, the two big ones, get your machine off the internet, however you're comfortable doing that, even if that means going and unplugging your Wi-Fi router, or your, your, your internet connection, um, and then don't turn off your machine. And then the next one is going to be contact contact your IT department, right? Get a hold of them. Uh, if you have a dedicated security team, get a hold of them. Otherwise, like I said, contact your IT team 
they should have an incident response plan and process uh, that's been developed and they and they'll tell you what to do from there but those yeah that's what I that would be my answer to that again it's what they do from there is going to differ from company to company but those would be the, the biggest recommendations I had okay perfect yeah well thank you Tyler um, Next up, we are going to talk to Charles Montgomery about remote access insufficiency and VPN readiness. Um, so Charles, one of the big challenges companies are experiencing as their workforce shifts to working from home is in-home bandwidth. And is it sufficient to support their work environments? So how can teams address this concern? And are there any changes that they can make to their in-home network or to VPNs? Oh, thank you, Stacey. Um, yeah, I mean, I definitely think as our workforce shifts to home, so does our risk, right? It's a, a landscape that's that's moving quickly, and uh, where we used to, you know, pay attention or where our resources used to be, uh, not that's not necessarily where they are today. Um, so, you know, when it comes to home bandwidth, there's some things that come to top to mind, right? Uh, applications that are extremely high bandwidth are difficult to support over remote VPN. So getting a list of those applications, identifying what those applications are and who's using them, um, that can go a long way in helping understand and mitigate the risk. Um, the second thing is I, I recommend doing a audit of your users' ISPs. Again, like it's really common for us to know, okay, as a corporation, we know what our ISPs are, but do we know what our end users' ISPs are? Um, depending on the type of organization, if you're a global organization with users around the world, this is probably not going to be that big a risk for you. But if 90% of your workforce lives in one city and they're using one or two ISPs and those ISPs go down, that can, that can literally bring your business down. Um, so that audit helps you do two things. Uh, you want to make sure you capture who the ISP is and then how much bandwidth that home user has, right? So we can start to line up that, that bandwidth that the user has with the applications that they'll actually be able to consume over it. Um, you know, separate from that, that home bandwidth question, um, you know, I do want to say another option that we always have is dedicated ISP, right? So um, if you're in a situation where uh, you just, you, you're not getting good performance from your, your current uh, home offering, sometimes it's worth, especially for a critical worker, to bring in a dedicated ISP link just for further internet usage, right? And you can get a, a business line and generally get better performance and some quality of service out of that. Um, and then from the VPN side, right, we, it's not just the home internet, right, it's our, our, um, our VPN and our remote access goes through our internet connection. Um, so, and that, that's, uh, that hits us twice, because as the packet comes to our VPN, it goes over our border firewall. And in this world of, you know, UTNs and unified threat platforms, um, a lot of times our border firewall is our VPN device. Um, and there's some things, there's some gotchas with that specific scenario. And like I said, it's becoming very common. Um, the first thing is keep in mind that your border firewall is gonna have a different throughput for traffic than it does for, um, for VPN, right? So for SSL VPN, you'll have a different throughput for uh, your traffic. So you wanna look at both those numbers. Um, oftentimes it's one third, right? So you might have a 10 gig firewall and it, and it can do like three gigs of, of VPN throughput. Um, sometimes it's less and sometimes it's more. Um, the other thing is the statistics to look at. Uh, make sure you're watching that firewall CPU, right? That's gonna be probably the best statistic to watch to look for the, the performance. Um, as that CPU climbs, you'll see both the VPN and your throughput take a hit. Um, the other thing to look at is the total number of users. This is a good time to uh, think about um, not only the number of sessions, which is like the posted, like this specific hardware platform can have a thousand users connected at once, but how many licenses do you have? Um, it's kind of funny because just today there there was a news story where Cisco is having to ration their VPN like Cisco is rationing VPN to their 100,000 remote users. So um, this is a problem everyone is facing and getting those numbers that will let you know where you're at and you can kind of like tie that to how many remote users you're expecting and uh, project something uh, kind of where your risk is there and if, if there's action that needs to be taken. Um, now, if you do find yourself, okay, you, you, you looked, my CPU's high, I don't have enough sessions, I don't have enough throughput, uh, I need to take action. There are some uh, specific remediations kind of TBC recommends. Um, the first house, if, if you're adding hardware, right, you realize you don't have enough throughput or you can't handle enough sessions, it's a good time to, to move to a dedicated device. Um, you know, 
there's a, a big cost saving in having a single platform. But when a dedicated device gets overran, it handles it much better than if that device is also handling internet traffic. And the reason is, is again, because our, our remote access users are coming through our, our uh, corporate VPN, uh, through our corporate border, if those are the same device, if that device does hit a limitation, they get hit twice. They get hit coming through the firewall and then they get hit at the VPN section. And it can cause um, even the QoS that's in the firewall to manage that kind of congestion to, to really not perform well and give a really poor user experience. So um, uh, specifically on Cisco and Palo Alto's, I've seen this, but I'm sure on most platforms, you'll have uh, a better performance with that, that split role, you know, kind of a dedicated VPN concentrator. Um, this is, like I said, if you're adding hardware, just something to consider, you know, buy the firewall for the VPN throughput, not specifically for the firewall throughput. Um, there's also some specific configurations to help that throughput question. Uh, one common one, split tunneling, where we, we have the concept of, do you have the, tra the internet traffic, the internet bound traffic for your VPN user come back to corporate to then go out to the corporate internet so it can have all the policies and inspection? Or do you use that local internet? Um, when you don't use split tunneling, that traffic kind of hits you twice, right? Because it first has to tunnel back to the enterprise and then it has to go back out to the internet. So it, it has a double cost on your, on your bandwidth. But at the same time, there are some security concerns. So before you decide to turn on split tunneling, you know, I would definitely be talking to Tyler. You wanna, you wanna bring your security team in and have that conversation to say, you know, what are the impacts of this? Because you don't get that, you know, that, corporate umbrella or that safety net, um, that traffic would be using the local internet to get out. Um, if, you're, if you're fighting the other side of that, sessions and licensing, this is a great time to look at your idle timeouts, right? Kicking users off that maybe have been on for an hour and haven't, haven't logged in. So that can kind of free up some licenses. Um, and then the, the third option or the th third thing we'll recommend is basically offloading applications, especially these high throughput applications we talked about earlier. So like your file transfer applications, your HD video applications. If you can, if you have external offerings all already, this is a great time to point those VPN users at the external DNS record. Again, before we were really rationing these uh, VPN resources, it was common for our VPN users to use an internal DNS record for something that was available externally. So if you happen to be in that scenario, that's just a freebie, you know, you just point the VPN users at the external record, they can then go out their local internet and they get that same service and you don't have that traffic coming home. But again, you wanna make sure you have that like for like security in place. This would be really common for like an HTTPS Azure app, right? Where it doesn't really matter where you're coming from, it's gonna be the same security. Um, it's also a great time to consider moving applications to the cloud in general. So maybe something locally. And again, you wanna focus on those high throughput applications. And that, that enables some really creative non-VPN options. Uh, and I think Eric will cover that in his section. So. Great, thank you very much, Charles. Um, one quick follow on question. Um, if my video or audio begins to falter, are, are there steps I can help to remedy that situation or information I can provide, you know, my IT support at that point? Yeah, I think that's going to be a really common problem for people, uh, especially as, you know, <laughs> we used to work from home and the kids would be off at school and, you know, the significant other might not be home. Um, so that's the first thing is wireless is a shared medium. So the more wireless devices we have on that wireless network, the worse the performance gets. And it also matters what those wireless devices are doing. If your kids are stream, streaming Netflix or Hulu, those HD applications will use a lot of bandwidth and a lot of that, that available wireless bandwidth for everyone. So <laughs> sometimes the best thing to do, you know, kick everyone off wireless. Um, home routers with dedicated guest SSIDs can help here. Oftentimes the primary SSID, SSIDs on a different bandwidth than uh, the, the guest SSID, so they don't share wireless space, that can help. Um, and a lot of times there's QoS settings in those routers where you can prefer a specific SSID. And then, you know, in worst case, I go back to what we said earlier, a dedicated uh, ISP with a dedicated router is always going to be the best solution and I'll add to that wired. Um, you know, if you're plugged in to a router on a wired experience, I mean, if you have a critical meeting or something, that may be the best way to go because, um, again, there's a lot of things out of our control in the wireless realm. Sometimes a microwave can take your laptop offline. So it's, it's something that you, you, uh, you're always going to get not necessarily better performance, but more reliable performance from a, a wired connection. Excellent. Thank you, Charles. Okay. 
So as our final speaker, we've got um, Eric Marshall. Now, Eric is gonna talk to us about bringing your own devices and risks and challenges around that. Uh, so welcome, Eric. Um, some of companies are not really set up to deploy work from home. Uh, so they rely a lot on personal devices of their employees. Is this risky? If so, why? And, and are there other solutions they should consider? Well, thank you, Stacey. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the answer to the question is absolutely is risky. Um, when you have to expose your company who is used to and have built policies around controlled devices that they provision, they provide, uh, and all of a sudden now introduce an entire swath of devices they have zero visibility into and zero control into, um, that, in, that it introduces a, a very significant inherent risk. Um, <clears throat> and then on top of that, just to get employees connected using these devices, again, Oftentimes you have things like VPN access and client control and uh, a bunch of different, you know, kind of unique ways that are, have been tuned specific to a corporate owned device that you don't have available to you on your, on your, you know, privately owned device that so many companies have to now relax a lot of security standards and policies just to be able to enable, you know, uh, people from home who are not using corporate devices to get in and actually work and, and produce like they, they normally would uh, again, uh, just increases the risk uh, profile quite a bit. Um, another challenge outside of just access and everything else is really just ensuring that you can get your employees connected to begin with. Um, you know, as Charles was talking about with VPN and how you set up uh, direct connections and understanding ISPs, just getting your employees online, taking it a step farther, uh, a lot of companies hadn't really thought of the scale um, at which, you know, we we're seeing in the work place today because of COVID and, and the response there. And so uh, to, to his point with Cisco, you know, actually having to divvy out um, and, and kind of monitor out their own VPN connections, many companies globally are, are dealing with this. So what are some more unique ways to manage connectivity without having to require something like VPN? Um, and so one of the big solutions out there that, uh, you know, a lot of companies have maybe dipped their toes into, but uh, most companies have not actually adopted is a dyed in the wool mobile device management platform uh, or solution set. And uh, there are many different ways to, to leverage these types of tools. And today I'll talk about three that kind of hit the, the large swath of devices out there. Um, obviously, the, if you think about mobile devices, uh, the majority from a desktop perspective is Windows. Uh, when it comes to things like tablets and phones, uh, the big two obviously are Apple and uh, uh, you know Google variant and, and Android, right? And so those are the, the, that covers the large swath of devices that people try to connect to and, and need to use to connect to uh, business applications, business services, on and on, right? So uh, one thing that organizations can do if they've already got some mobile device management capabilities in place and they have the ability to um, you know, extend out some of their business services beyond VPN securely. So leveraging things like cloud services. So Office 365, Microsoft 365, that platform is built very well to support mobile device uh, management and, and user base access, essentially turning all of their, their internal applications into almost uh, software as a service, which is pretty compelling. On the Apple space, there's, uh, you know, a, a business grade or business account solution that, um, uh, companies can tap into and again a lot of organizations use apple almost exclusively um, and it has traditionally been a pretty tough uh, bear to manage from a business perspective um, and conversely the same thing in education so a lot of school systems um, you know have either been deploying chromebooks or apple devices for years in some cases decades and uh, there are solutions available to tie in and centrally manage these devices um, directly through Apple, but then there's some other tools that can really uh, bolster and, and enhance businesses' capabilities to provide solutions and services as well that they can tap into. On the Apple side, one of the big leaders in that space is a company called Jamf, and um, they're, uh, they, they integrate directly in with Apple so that an organization or school can, uh, can very, very rapidly uh, set up policies, procedures, and access capabilities to any device anywhere in the company, as long as they have, or your country, as long as they have access to the internet. Um, you can essentially log on to a link, 
and the company in the back end will build a secure profile uh, that will give a device also sort of like a sandbox experience, if you will. And so if there is an application that's uniquely, you know, only available inside a company, uh, you can actually now enable any device securely to connect up through a, a defined profile that Jamf has, you know, given them access to. It'll carve out basically a sandbox on their device they will then see an application pop up on their screen, whatever device you're using. They can click on it, type in their, their work credentials as they normally would. This entire connection is, is typically encrypted end to end. Uh, so you don't have to worry about outside threats coming in and, and uh, you know, trying to hijack your link. Um, and then you know, business as usual once you get in and start using it. And when you're done, you disconnect, the sandbox goes away and there's zero footprint on these personally owned devices. Um, so you really control that experience. Now within that, that confines, you have a lot more granularity and control over uh, publicly owned devices or, or you know, privately owned devices um, as it confines into dealing with uh, work-based connectivity and, and, uh, and organizational control over uh, you know, how people can access devices beyond just requiring a VPN connection. Um, you know, there's a number of benefits to that. Uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of times in a mobile workforce, you have folks who are just not always in a city, you know, or some big populated area with a lot of available bandwidth. Um, some of the other challenges that help solve is for those folks in rural areas who have very slow connections, um, where running a, a thick client, if you will, on a desktop isn't always viable. And uh, a lot of times you can actually use these, these MDM or mobile device management solutions to produce a, uh, a much faster, cleaner experience to mobile uh, applications um, than ever before uh, through a number of different technologies as well. Some of the other major players in this space would be uh, AirWatch, which has uh, been out for a long time, owned by VMware. They've now included it in their uh, Workspace ONE product. Um, uh, it, taking a step farther with Office 365 and that ecosystem is a product called Intune and uh, readily available uh, with additional licensing if you've already you know, subscribed as a business into Office 365 or because of this effort, you've decided to try to set up a hybrid cloud environment um, in your own company, actually leverage Azure and, and Office 365 to deal with uh, access management, identity management, et cetera. That's a tool that can be used and, and bolstered to build the same experience I just described. Um, probably a third would be uh, um, Zen App and uh, Zen Desktop. They have a, a new tool. Uh, also very, very compelling. Uh, there's a number of providers in this space, but those are probably the leaders in the market. Um, and I know for a fact that there are enhanced acceleration services that can be uh, produced to where a company can really start spinning up mobile device management, assuming they have, you know, a list of criteria checkpoints in place as it relates to what type of access they need to give, how they want to secure it, how they want to operationalize it, and then ultimately how they want to uh, govern it and ensure that they're they're maintaining security postures as they're deploying these new new services. Um, but there's there's rapid quit start services that can get people up and running in as little as a few days and uh, then deployed nationally. And so it's it's something worth looking into and something I think will add a huge amount of value to organizations who need to tackle very quickly, um, you know, the challenge from a security standpoint of how to secure devices they don't own and control and how to help get their employees to securely get access uh, applications and services, even if they're constrained by bandwidth based on locality or, or technology capability and prowess. A lot of good information. So thank you, Eric. Thank um, you. We do have a follow on question, which is um, with all the families who have multiple devices and are working from home, what's the best way to you know, ensure they're using the lowest risk device and or limiting the usage to ensure they're able to remain productive? Sure, um, you know, some general guidelines when it comes to that, that answer is, um, if you're going to be leveraging a, a device for work, um, typically you wanna make sure that device is used by the person who needs to produce work. And if you can, um, have your, you know, avoid having your children and, and a spouse and everyone else use the same device. Um, you know, for many companies who may not have mobile device management as a solution, they still rely on VPN, et cetera. The company needs to invest some time and, and uh, you know, experience trying to lock down and secure that device as best they can and tune it as best they can to support the, the work operations. And so it's, it's pretty, pretty inherent and important that, um, you know, people kind of maintain the sanctity of that, that device if they can. 
Uh, when it comes to how to, how to connect and manage multiple devices, uh, there's a few uh, basic ways to do it in one sort of geeky way, and, and it's fun to talk about, I think. Um, you know, with, with the advent of, of everyone, everyone has a Wi-Fi device or Wi-Fi router in their home, um, some key areas are using uh, device prioritization. Um, that's something that almost every modern Wi-Fi router has. So you have to log into the admin interface, and there's a section in there uh, in many different places depending on the vendor. Um, but uh, where you can actually say, okay, well, in this house, I have 10 devices. Out of those 10, I want to prioritize to make sure that the traffic goes to these three, one of which would be your work device, for instance. Uh, or if you and your spouse or, or even kids are in the same house and they all have work, you know, which device is super important that you can't have go down, you know, uh, no matter what, uh, use it, it been, again, depending on what your available bandwidth is. Um, so you can actually prioritize and, and assign that at the router level pretty quickly. It takes a few seconds. Um, and the changes happen almost immediately, which is a, a good way to go. Another one is uh, ensuring that you have proper coverage in your own home. Um, a lot of folks say, well, you know, we're going to have uh, Wi-Fi downstairs in the family room and here's where our router's set up. Uh, but typically, you, you know, people, if they're on multiple streams, which I am in my household, for instance, you know, I'm, I'm on conference calls all day and, and now my girls uh, are and you know, on remote learning classes and things like that for school. And so they have to each be in separate rooms. And so they go upstairs to their rooms and they didn't have the best coverage in the world and they didn't really have a need in the past. So how do I get them there? Uh, some of that is making sure my router's placed appropriately so I can get the best coverage possible. I've also invested in a, uh, a mesh network uh, the other day. So what that allows me to do is, is distribute out the Wi-Fi presence throughout my house. So I don't have to deal with any kind of, uh, um, you know, drop in service no matter where I'm at. So, it, you know, it took me 30 minutes to deploy and I'm, I'm good to go. And I've, I've solved that challenge. Um, a more geeky way, and what you'll find is that more and more of your, your neighbors have spun up these devices, Wi-Fi routers, et cetera. So if you look at and try to connect to a Wi-Fi network, you're going to see a growing list in many cases of tons of different routers with all kinds of funky names. And uh, you got to choose the best one for the, for the group. But you also see next to it a lot of times, depending on the interface, you'll see exactly what frequency, what range they're actually trying to connect to from a radio perspective. And a lot of them, a lot of folks who don't know better, will leave it at default. And default for a lot of these routers is, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll have a number of a channel. And you see all these devices kind of popping up in the same channel oftentimes. Not, not everybody can see this, but... For those who can, it's a, it's a good thing to look at. So what you don't want to be is on the same channel as everybody else. That can cause some, some contention on your radio feed. That can also slow your signal down and ultimately affect your performance to your device. And so if you select something that's unique, great. Another way to go is to set it to auto. And uh, what they'll, it'll look for, the device kind of looks for, um, you know, the stronger feed that's available in your area. It'll automatically set the, uh, the channel to support that. Um, and you're, you're pretty much off and running let the device manage itself, but not every device can do that. So that's something to look into. And again, it's in the advanced settings, typically in your Wi-Fi settings in your router. Very good information. So thank you very much, Eric. You're welcome. Um, so that concludes the, the webinar today. I want to thank everyone for your participation and thank our three experts for the information that they've been able to share. Uh, TB Consulting is taking proactive measures to enable our clients to prioritize the health and wellness of the community while maintaining productivity and minimizing business risk. We hope this discussion has helped solve some of the challenges that you're faced with today. And we do offer a free 30-minute consultation with our experts if you do have some additional challenges you want to discuss. Thank you for joining and stay healthy. Mm -hmm.